Remember her? The girl whose books you carried? The heartbeat that drove around in the old jalopy? Sure you do. Well, the kids are still ordering a Coke with two straws at the corner drugstore. They're still passing the fraternity pins around. But here at Garfield High in Los Angeles, they've got a new twist in the read and writing and arithmetic stuff. It's reading, writing, and riveting now. That's right, I said riveting. Riveting, welding, trimming, filing, and a lot of other subjects the junior set never took before. Yes, sir, here's what the well-dressed co-ed wears at Garfield, where your old girlfriend's kid sister is just as keen but twice as busy. Here's a new kind of jukebox sending with a solid victory tune. Working right in their own school shop for Avion, the subcontractor supplying parts to Southern California aircraft companies, these 16 to 18 year old Garfield kids spend four hours a day on book learning and four on the production line. They get school credit for their work, draw regular wages, put a big slice into war bonds. And the school insists they keep up their grades too. This double duty doesn't phase them a bit. So far, they've breezed right through. Here's a new style jitterbug. The day of the big football game, the game of games, day of days, there wasn't an absentee in the lot. Brother, that's patriotism. The old rah-rah stuff is nowhere for the duration. These hepcats are too busy with the rivet gun. Stuff they turn out must pass all government requirements and does. Avion and Army Air Forces inspectors can't praise their work on these nacelle doors for Douglas Plains too highly. And here at Lockheed Aircraft, they're trying another youth power plan. Boy power this time. Cooperating with the Board of Education, Lockheed has taken the lead in hiring high school boys on a part-time basis. They used to tinker with jalopies, but working on jigs this size takes them right out of the tinker class. They're big time now, helping out in one of the hot planes of the war, the Lockheed Lightning. Small fry? Sure. But don't let anybody tell you these youngsters aren't doing a man-sized job. Working side by side with older men who treat them like one of themselves, they're on the beam with the lowest absentee lateness record of any group in the plant. Foremen rate them on a par with old timers. They learn fast, at a stiff pace, keep it up. From making machine tools to final assembly, there isn't any job too big or too small for these kids to handle. And there's no time for horseplay. Some work in the 4 4 field. Others work an eight-hour shift a month, go to school for a month. All of them are helping Lockheed meet towering production goals. There are millions of boys all over the country able and anxious to roll up their sleeves, and other communities are investigating the Los Angeles plan. Here's what the boys think about it. This is mighty good training, but the most important part is, well, it's helping to win the war, even if it is only a little bit. I'm from Texas. I'm going to be a Navy flyer. Just as soon as they'll take me. But until then, I can take my crackers and axes and jobs this way. I help a woman with a herd of 30 Toggenberg goats. Airplanes are important, but so are goats. People who need goat's milk come from miles around. And if the goats aren't milked, these sick people will have a hard time. Goat's milk has a smaller curd than cow's milk and is therefore more easily digested. So I guess I'm helping people on both jobs. Those Lockheed Lightnings carry with them the hopes and dreams of the American kids who helped put them in the sky. some brain work. How the hell do you expect a guy to study with all that racket going on? Study? Nuts. When I get at them Nazis, I ain't gonna clunk them over the head with no books. What you gotta give them dopes is a belly full of lead. Hello, Superman. Huh? Well, if I was 
Superman, I bet you I'd show him plenty. Okay, chum. As technical fairy voice class, I now pronounce you Snafoopaman. Oh, boy! Enemies of democracy, beware! <laughs> Like a job for Snap Hooperman! Hey, wait! You forgot your navigation maps! Thank you very much. But I am not bombing Berlin with maps this season. <laughs> Japanese tank. Come out, you bandy-legged disturber of world peace. I eat to do General, I ooh, ooh, ooh. Trying to bomb our port, eh? the Army Navy Screen Magazine Cutting Room, where a combat film taken by Army, Navy, and Marine cameramen comes in from battlefronts all over the world. The Marine Staff Sergeant with the Expert Medal is 22-year-old Norman Hatch from Boston, Massachusetts. Sergeant Hatch went in with the first wave on the landing at Tarawa, armed with a pistol and a hand camera, and brought back a film record of the fighting on that island that looks as though it had been taken through a front-line gun sight. Let me see that second. You know, that's the best frame of combat film I've ever seen. Hey, that's okay. And when an army man says that to a Marine brother, he means it. Oh, it was just luck. You mean guts. Well, it didn't take any more guts than you fellows had when you went in on Kiska. Well, we had plenty of camera, plenty of film in Kiska, but we did apps. <laughs> <laughs> How many cameras did it take in with you? Took in three ammo hand cameras. Food Lurko got his camera wet the first day. Yeah, that left us with two cameras. Uh, Kelly's and mine. We took in about 5,000 feet of film. I only shot at 2,000. Only 2,000? Well, that's all. I picked my shots. <laughs> Did you shoot much film on the uh, ship? 
Well, I've got a cut reel over here. Do you want to see it? Yeah. yeah I I, all I don't know is what I've seen in the newsreel. We shot some stuff on the way over, and the Navy boys shot some stuff on the wagons. This is a shot of the task force underway. I was trying to save film, but it was my first big job, and there were a couple of pictures I had to take. On the last day out, Father Francis Kelly celebrated Mass. Twenty-four hours later, a lot of those fellows were dead. A Navy steward baked a cake, and the frosting had a big laugh. But the warning didn't seem so funny when we hit the beach on the next day. Every Marine in the outfit, including the cameraman, knew as much about the operation as his CO. We were going out to take Basio Island, key to an atoll called Tarawa, a move that would drive the Japs out of that part of the Pacific up into their bases in the Marshalls a couple of hundred miles north. D-Day was the 20th of November. The naval bombardment began at 0500. There weren't any Jap airplanes around, but there's a Jap sub out there that the boys kept on the move. One thing I didn't want to take a picture of was a Jap torpedo heading for my boat. Our Army and Navy planes had been pasting the island for five days, and it didn't seem as though anyone on base show could have lived through that bombing. And we weren't green. I've served with the Marines for five years, and more than half of the task force were veterans of Guadalcanal. But we figured there wouldn't be many live Japs left on the island. Navy men on the wagons took these pictures of the loading of powder charges. I was slated to go in with the first wave, and we were waiting around with the Amtraks. Everybody got a kick out of watching the wagons unload on the target. Twenty-eight hundred tons of bombs and shells hit the beaches and cut through the pounds like a whipsaw. We packed shovels along with us, but we figured we wouldn't have to dig any foxholes, only Jap graves. There was a heavy smoke coming off the island, carried along by an easterly breeze. The Japs were still answering our fire when we headed in. The water was choppy. These pictures of the first wave of Amtrak were taken about a thousand yards from shore. We were heading straight in for the bloodiest operation in the history of the Marine Corps, but we still thought it was going to be a picnic. There's a gasoline dump going up. The air support was good. We kept about 100 planes in the sky all the time, blasting and strafing the Japs along the beach. Then the Higgins boat snagged on a reef, and the Japs began to get our range and the range of the Amtraks. We had to get out and wade about 400 yards of terrific crossfire. The sniper was fire empty when I got those shots. These shots were made a few minutes after the landing. The guys were hugging the beach, trying to get their wind after the 400-yard push. It wasn't going to be any 24-hour operation. There were plenty of Japs on the island, and they decided to die there. The Japs had spent every day and night for 15 months getting the island ready for a fight. The top of that blockhouse was about 15 feet wide. The exits covered with machine gun and rifle fire. The Japs kept coming out, trying to knock out the machine gun. 
There's one of them. That sniper's got a beat on another. There's a squad of them. Boy, it was hot that day and was I sweating. the truth, but it doesn't give you any idea of how it smells, and the smell on that island was bad. The wounded started going back six minutes after we hit the beach, and the stretcher bearers, all members of the shore party, were the unsung heroes of Tarawa. Plenty of them got hit. Stretcher bearers loaded the wounded onto rubber rafts and pushed them out to the Higgins boat off the reef. That was the only way of getting them out. They couldn't load them on at the pier because of the snipers. We lost more than 1,000 Marines. More than 2,000 of our men were wounded. I'd served with the outfit for 15 months, and I knew a lot of them. On the third day, that Marine, the one without the helmet, was souvenir hunting when he found a couple of Japs in that foxhole. The Japs lost 5,700 men. Imperial Japanese Marines defending an island that wasn't two miles square. That gives you an idea of how important Tarawa was in their plan. It was the stiffest price they've ever paid and one of their greatest defeats. We call those two the brothers. We brought in a few Japanese prisoners for intelligence. No more than a couple of hundred. That sniper was nearly six feet tall. The prisoners had to be stripped to keep them from concealing weapons. And they'd hide a weapon anywhere. They were sullen and still hoped up over the idea that they were supermen, even after they'd been captured. The Koreans were different. They were men whose country had been captured by the Japanese. And the Japs brought them out to Tara to work as slaves. When we got back to Pearl Harbor, they told us that in Cairo, Roosevelt, Churchill, and Chiang Kai-shek had guaranteed Korea her independence on the same day that we saved these Koreans from the Japanese. I took these pictures the day before Thanksgiving. The camera gives you a good idea the kind of desolation the cracked brains in Berlin and Tokyo have wished on the world. The wrecked Jap equipment we found has been brought in from all over. China, Malaya, Burma, Manchukuo. They had that two by four island loaded down with the loot from every country they've overrun. They even dragged guns down from the old British fortress at Singapore. But none of it was much good to them after the second day of fighting with the guns knocked out and the gunners dead. There's a kitten I found in the tracks of a Jap tank. The smell of water brought her out. That's me giving her the water. The other cameraman took the picture. The men got around to taking freshwater baths on the third day, and boy, they needed them. CBs were already working on the two bomber strips on the island, and on the fourth day, Tarawa began to function as an advanced air base. Ensign Bill Kelly of Newcastle, Pennsylvania, brought the first plane in. Everybody got around to watch the flag go up. A lot of good guys from the outfit weren't there anymore. I'm glad I got these pictures, because when you remember the roaches you've been fighting and the things they represented, and when you saw the flag go up and remembered the freedoms that flag stood for, you knew you were in on a good thing.